All right, our keynote speaker for today is a great friend of San Antonio. He was last year's chairman of the board of the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce. He is a former U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, but his special connection to this event is that he was mayor of San Antonio when this memorial was dedicated 30 years ago, and he spoke at that ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Henry Cisneros. John, thank you very much. To Mayor Taylor and the public officials from all our levels of government, to our civic leaders led by our Chamber of Commerce, our present chairman, Renee Flores, to the veterans organizations present, and we all appreciate the special contribution that John Baines made all those years ago. He was a compelling presence then, you couldn't say no to, and I wouldn't say no to him today either. To our men and women in service today, thank you for your service, and to friends of our veterans in San Antonio, one and all. We're gathered today 30 years from the dedication of this monument in the shadow of an auditorium that was originally dedicated to our veterans of World War I, and then later, as Jimmy Haslocker just reminded me, after a fire that took it down to the bare frame in 1981, it was rededicated to the veterans of all wars. We stand before this monumental sculpture, specially dedicated to our Vietnam veterans. We're on sacred ground. As I look at this monument, in particular the radio man, Marine radio man, calling in care for a fallen warrior, I'm reminded of San Antonio's evolution over the years to our present role in military medicine. Today, we had the capability to take wounded warriors off the field and have them live with wounds and burns that would have not been possible just several decades ago. So this monument is, is symbolic and important in many ways. Today, 30 years after the dedication, we stop to pay homage to the men and women who defend our country. In this place, we honor those particularly who served in the theater of Vietnam. Some were in combat, some supported them logistically, some were wounded, some paid the ultimate sacrifice. More than 58,000 of our fellow Americans paid that ultimate sacrifice. They answered their country's call and set out to do their duty. It was a much debated war, not understood by all, opposed by many. Protests filled the streets of American cities. But 55 years after the war's origin in the early 1960s, we can look back across the prism of time. As we look back on that era, there were tensions of two diametrically opposed systems. Soviet-led global communism on the one hand, and American-inspired democracy and ideals of human freedom. In the years after World War II, and let's keep in mind this was only 15 years or so from the end of hostilities in 1946 that the Vietnam War came to our attention, the Soviet Union had encircled and enslaved a good part of Eastern Europe. Countries like Poland and Hungary and Romania and Albania the Baltic states, the Crimean region, and the Ukraine. And China, having been through a revolution, became a full, virulent communist state. Korea had been the scene of a bloody war just a few years earlier within that decade and ended up divided with a brutal regime enslaving the people north of the armistice line, a regime that continues to this date. And so when the communist push began for Laos and Cambodia and Vietnam, it was logical to see the pattern extending into the domination of Southeast Asia. In retrospect, there are respected positions as to the nature of the Vietnam conflict. Some viewed it as a part of a communist drive for hegemony, extension of empire by an avowed communist leader, Ho Chi Minh. Others saw it as an indigenous movement to throw off the historic colonization of European powers. In Vietnam, it was the French. 
But suffice it to say that our nation's leaders found themselves on the si one side of a global struggle with Russia and China intent on global domination, an imposition of their system of brutal centralization, crushed human spirits, extinction of enterprise, of wanton mass murders. Our leaders decided to take a stand and committed American treasure and manpower in Vietnam. Forty years after the cessation of hostilities, today, it's not possible to assert that every decision was precisely correct. But it is possible to say that the world has changed profoundly and the Pacific region is largely at peace. It is increasingly prosperous. It is widening human liberties and it is open to the world as never in the last century. And part of the indecipherable equation of history is that the American decision to hold the line in Southeast Asia was a part of this outcome. The Americans who fought and died did not die in vain. The Americans who were wounded, some permanently disabled, did not suffer in vain. The Americans whose lives were disrupted and memory scarred did not interrupt their lives in vain. As we look back across the last 55 years, we appreciate their sense of duty, we admire their selflessness, and we honor their sacrifice. San Antonio today, interestingly enough, as a city, has ties to that region. Japan is one of the strongest economies in the world, and we have a sister city there in Kumamoto. Hong Kong is a world center of innovation and commerce. China, despite tensions there in the East China Sea and its continuing push for a major role in the Pacific, is, fun is finding its own path to enterprise and modern processes of governance. We have a sister city there in Wuxi. Taiwan is a platform for world trade. Our sister city there is Kaohsiung. Korea stands as a bulwark against North Korea. We have a sister city there in Gwangju. And India is a major trading partner in the region, and our sister city there is Chennai. And Vietnam itself is a complex of reconciliation and progress. More than 58,000 American lives were lost in Vietnam. The human mind cannot calculate what the region would be like today if Americans had not engaged there and our men and women warriors had not demonstrated our nation's resolve. Even as we reflect on the significance of geopolitics and world history, on a day like today, we must acknowledge the effect of the sacrifice of each of those 58,000 Americans on their families, on friends, on communities. Allow me for a moment to reflect on three that I remember personally. Albert Tejerina from San Angelo, Texas, was a senior at Texas A&M the year I arrived as a freshman. I remember the day in a very tough uh, military corps of cadets when I looked at this, this, this leader. He was a commander of a major corps unit, the A&M band, fighting Texas Aggie band. And I could see the path between the shy, intimidated young cadets that we were as freshmen and this leader four years later. Al piloted a fighter bomber in Vietnam. He was shot out of the sky and killed instantly while we were still in the Corps at A&M. Mike Noonan was a classmate of mine from the Houston area, class of 1968. He was never the profile of a person you would see as a future hero. He was shy, he was quiet, he was studious. He became, however, a forward air controller, flying Cessnas over combat zones, and was shot down. Other classmates of mine sent his body home. And then there was Jesse Robledo, who lived at 2903 Monterey Street, 
Monterrey Street on the city's west side, a couple of miles from here. I grew up at 2906 Monterey across the street. As, you, as boys, best friends, we sat under the fig tree in my parents' backyard, cut a slice of our skin and mixed our blood. He was my blood brother. I was home from A&M and in my room at home the afternoon in 1968 when I heard a woman scream from across the street. I went to the window to see Jesse's mother, Mrs. Robledo, had collapsed into her family's arms as the Marines on the front porch gave her the news. Jesse, a U.S. Marine, took an AK-47 shot in the chest as he jumped off a helicopter at Quezon, the same place this memorial is placed. I waited at the San Antonio airport for his casket to come off the plane a few weeks later. These were fine young men. Each would have made a difference in our society. Each answered the call of duty. They did not want to go to war. They were not seeking glory. They knew it would be the hardest thing they ever did, but they went when called. Albert, Mike, Jesse, and thousands of others never got to marry their sweethearts. They never knew the joy of being fathers and having children. They never had another home-cooked meal. They never got to sit in the backyards at home and bask in the pride of their parents. They never knew the satisfaction of a career. They never enjoyed the reward of reliving good times with best friends. They never got to see the success of our nation in the intervening decades in building the post-Vietnam Pacific region to which their sacrifice contributed. But we, the living, the fortunate, who have been the beneficiaries of their service and sacrifice, we know what they did. And we know what 58,000 others did. We remember, and this week we raise up that remembrance. Duty, honor, country. Responsibility, sacrifice, selflessness. Courage and valor, love of nation, and faithful service. These values we cherish, these Americans we honor today in this place. And we thank the Lord they were Americans. Thank you very much.